Please just listen. I know why you're here, Neo. I know what you've been doing. I know why you hardly sleep, why you live alone, and why night after night you sit at your computer. You're looking for him. I know because I was once looking for the same thing. And when he found me, he told me I wasn't really looking for him. I was looking for an answer. It's the question that drives us mad. It's the question that brought you here. You know the question just as I did. What is the Matrix? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you dirty dog. <laughs> Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 126 today, which is back to Erica's choice. What are we talking about today? We are talking about The Matrix from 1999, written and directed by the Wachowskis with Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, Hugo Weaving, and Joe Pantoliano. It's about a young man who is made aware that the world he is living in does not exist and is in fact a creation of machines to enslave humans. Now, as of this recording, the film has made about 28 trajillion, kajillion, babillion, million dollars, and it was so successful that there were two sequels. And this created a trilogy of sorts. There was The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions, both from 2003, also written and directed by the Wachowskis. Lana Wachowski said that the first movie was pretty typical in its approach. The second was a deconstruction subverting everything we thought to be true in the first film, so screw you, I guess. And then the third film was more ambiguous and asked quite a lot of the audience, really for us to be participating in the construction of the meaning of the entire world. Now, I mention this because we got some really cool news, which I didn't know at the time that I chose the film. We've got officially a fourth Matrix film in development. It's set to be released in 2021, and Lana Wachowski is back, Lily is working on a different project, and Keanu and Carrie Ann are both back. We're going to tackle just the first film, because on its own, there's a ton of stuff to cover. Now, were you aware that this was added in 2012 to the National Film Registry? I absolutely was not. Very cool. It also received four Academy Awards, film editing, sound effects editing, visual effects, and sound. I saw this in the theater. I assume you probably did too. And I really do remember the way it felt at the time when that Warner logo comes up with the ominous music. That opening still to me had a lot of Batman heavy associations with it. And I think in retrospect, that feeling was indicative that we weren't ready for what was coming, that I had a certain set of expectations that were about to be just blown apart. I think it was the first time that I saw the production logo itself played with, all the way through the other additional logos into the first few frames of the film. It made a huge impression on me. I did tell people at the time, pretty much with anyone within shouting distance, that this film changed my life and I meant it. You ready to find out why? Yeah, I am absolutely ready. <laughs> Though I may have my suspicions already. Is it just because you also were constantly blasting Rob Zombie's Dragula all the time? No, I wasn't. Speaking of sound, though, boy, I do not miss dial-up. I don't know about you. It is a great sound design for this world. It's that metallic, warped tech feel. It still gets me excited. It puts me in the mood for something different. Should we bust out the AOL startup discs? I once tried to cancel that subscription after getting the startup and the representative told me it didn't seem like I was serious <laughs> about really giving them a trial. I'm, I am 100% sure that's what that person said. Now, I tend to forget that we start right away with a woman character and we see 
the police start to descend, we meet our interchangeable computer agents with those deliberate speech patterns, and we're about to learn how deadly one little girl can be. I was really into this beginning, especially at the time. This whole idea that there are larger, more conspiratorial forces at work. This was something that was part of the zeitgeist at the end of the 90s as well. This was prime X-Files time and territory. We'd seen a fair amount of hacker or cybersecurity oriented stuff previously, but that didn't exactly set my world on fire. Hackers, sneakers, the net, Keanu and Johnny Mnemonic. Take sneakers out of that, please. That's a great movie. <laughs> I think prior to The Matrix, my favorite hacker-oriented thing was probably War Games. And I know that fire might have been lit for you really early with Cloak and Dagger, maybe? Yeah, all of that young person adventure. Was this a genre that you gravitated to, or were you more into the espionage angle rather than the technology? I think you're absolutely right. The espionage, spy stuff, way more interesting to me, which is why I do mention Sneakers. Those other films didn't do it for me either, even though I saw every single one. But I was in that prime X-Files watching territory every single week. Well, based on that track record of those other films, I was wary about this going in. I was not completely in the tank for The Matrix when I sat down in the theater. But it couldn't have been a better year for the themes and the subject. It's 1999. We're standing on the precipice of a new millennium. We're looking at the future coming right at us. And that's what this opening feels like. It has the connotation of doomsday, Armageddon, some sort of radical shift to life as we know it is about to happen. When it comes to that stuff, do you allow yourself to get swept up in these futuristic expectations? Are you disappointed when you wake up the next day and nothing is different, say, right after Y2K, for example. Full disclosure, I bought two bottles of water for Y2K. <laughs> two? That was my whole <laughs> prepper experience. I guess I thought, oh, that'll be enough. I think I have some canned goods. I was totally fine when everything was the same the next day. I'm not necessarily a fan of feeling like the world at large is set out against me somehow. Well, I'm not necessarily thinking about this all adversarially. What I was thinking more was, if you're asking me if I am disappointed that I don't get around everywhere by jetpack right now, then yes, I am. Good point. I'm also happy to not hear any more about ISO 9001 certification anymore. It seemed <laughs> like I heard that all the time. Now, we're talking about this futuristic look, but there's a bit of a throwback here. I really noticed in this viewing how the first big chunk of the film... When we're completely centered in what we will come to know as the Matrix, it's filmed in this very Hitchcockian style. And I think that very much fits the person against the state kind of conspiracy theory feel to it. You can see that in that big staircase chase here, that deep focus. It reminds me a lot of North by Northwest. And also, visually speaking, we're establishing the look of the world of the Matrix, which is this green set to evoke those kind of old school monitors, which I totally know, but maybe people today, young people today, aren't as familiar with. So I see that look. I see this world bathed in that charcoaly green, off-centered color, and it seems completely believable to me. How about for you? Did you feel that this world was believable? And then by extension, are there other of these sci-fi worlds that you do find believable? Yes, I believe the Matrix, and yes, there definitely are larger other sci-fi worlds I believe in, and I think simplicity is probably key for most of them. At least for my favorites, no matter the budget, it's typically smart to rein in the speculation, that stuff I was talking about, what's coming in the future. I feel like it's always best if that is just a step to the left of what exists right now. And that's one thing the Matrix does well. It's set in the present quote unquote, but it's somehow still slightly out of time a little bit. So it keeps stuff from aging badly. Or in the case of this green tint that you're talking about, you're choosing something that is slightly outdated already. So years down the line, it doesn't look any more out of date than it did at the time. Also, I think limiting the geography is a good idea too. If you can make it a bottle episode, that will definitely help. So obviously the original Andromeda strain is one of my favorites. Shane Carruth's Primer is a good example of working within your budget. And I think in terms of bigger budget stuff, The Martian does that really well. 
if we're talking about something more extravagant and wide ranging, I think the original Jurassic Park is fantastic for that. After now having been to Tokyo, Blade Runner doesn't feel all that impossible. It's probably one of those cases where your affinity for the visual aesthetics probably plays a large part in defining your sci-fi experience in terms of the building blocks of the Matrix. I think we both are fans of this color palette, both the blue and the green, and what all of that evokes as we go along. But I think that connection to your time, it works both ways too. The presentation of the construct later, it feels like an Apple commercial to me now when I watch it. What was once cutting edge is now advertising. Isn't that always the pattern? The thing that is revolutionary just becomes marketing in its second iteration. How about you? Are there particular sci-fi things that feel real to you? Because I know you're probably not as big of a fan of the genre as I am. And I think you hit upon why I have trouble with it. If I don't feel like I have a focal point or a way in, it just is too much for me to gather, which is maybe where they kind of lost me in films two and three. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe what keeps you shut out of anime a little bit? Possibly. It's just feels so unrealistic. I can't identify with anything or I can't identify anything. But there are a couple of films that came to mind. The Abyss, you know, I'm a huge fan of that, and Alien. And I think that the thing they both share is this idea of being centered around work. Should they rework both of those as workplace sitcoms? They could. It does seem like a believable sort of blue collar atmosphere that will never go away somehow. And also, when you set something under the sea, I truly believe that that is a completely unexplored depth and we have no idea of the creatures out there. And then, of course, the vast infinity of space. Anything seems possible. Well, after having this recent viewing, I think The Matrix, it still definitely holds up. Parts of it still feel fresh, even. And that is hard enough for a straight drama or comedy that's 20 years old, but especially difficult for sci-fi. And I think for me, a part of what makes it relatable isn't necessarily the realness, quote unquote, of the setting as it looks now, but how often familiar elements of other properties that we know really well pop up. Orwell's 1984 is a great example. It plays like an anime, so your familiarity with that genre would probably figure prominently especially something like Ghost in the Shell. Aeon Flux sticks out in relation to things like Trinity's costume and her movements. Kung Fu films are obviously a huge influence. There's a little touch of the Terminator in here. So if you're catching all the influences, if they feel second nature to you, does that contribute to the believability of it, even though it's a combination of other fictions? Yes, I mentioned the Hitchcockian element. When I see that, I know I'm in this man-on-the-run kind of world. And I know where I am. One last thing while we're on this subject. When it comes to sci-fi, are you more of a utopian or dystopian kind of girl? Uh, da doy. You know the answer <laughs> to that. It is utopian. Why do I want to be more depressed than I already am? I don't want to envision myself covered in soot, wearing <laughs> rags, trying to murder a rat for the last slice of boot to stay alive on. So let's meet our man on the run. That is the hacker Neo, a.k.a. the one, question mark, a.k.a. Thomas Anderson in his daily life. Did you know that Neo, when you rearrange it, spells one? I do. Whoa. I do now. Probably evaded me for a while. <laughs> no <way. laughs> now, I do want to mention something else that was new to me here. I loved the framing, again, of this first third of the film. They're using a third of the side of the frame, quite a lot of just one character on the left side. It's really fascinating. I love seeing something new every time I watch something that I adore and think that I know really well. Now, Neo is on the trail of a white rabbit that takes him to this big club scene, which I think I kind of recognize. I'm sure I've danced with some people in leather and been groped a couple of times. There was somebody in a cage always. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about this soundtrack, separate from the score. It straddles this line between new metal and then industrial slash raver slash goth. Rob Zombie next to Propeller Heads, next to Marilyn Manson, next to Ministry, next to the Deftones, next to Prodigy. We often talk about the importance to me of music in film, but how about you? It may be for different reasons or connections, but you have that too, right? Oh, absolutely. 
I tend to pay more attention in film to if I feel like something is underscored too much. Now, this episode, when Neo first walks into this club, you said there were a lot of things you recognized in that. Is it because you identify with elements of those subcultures or was it something just more generally familiar? More generally familiar. If I walked into that club or something akin to that club in Boise, Idaho, it would probably be Nine Inch Nails playing. That would be the hardest we would get. Well, whether or not these were specifically your people, that's universal you, not just you, Erica, it seems like there were plenty of people for whom this was their lifestyle, but they were and probably still are the distinct minority. Yet, so many people were eager to dive into this world. This was hugely popular. It didn't make kajillion bazillion like you said at the beginning, but it did make 463 million worldwide. What makes the culture at large ready for it? Ready for something like this to come along? What do you think the conditions were that made people jump on this versus something like the 13th floor, which also came out that year. I'm thinking again, back to the musical references and how I feel like personally me, I'm just kind of a step away from all of that. Is there some element of tourism in this that, wow, this seems exciting and interesting. I can kind of dip my toes in here. Oh, I think there's definitely that element. That's actually exactly where I was headed with this. Because some of these things feel like they would be still outside the comfort zone of mainstream audiences. I'm thinking particularly about the elements of the costumes that aren't just goth inspired, but they're actual fetish gear. I do have to admit, I really like the idea that vanilla audiences were feeling a tingle that they couldn't exactly put a finger on when they were watching this. A kind of, I don't know exactly what to call it, but I know I like it feeling. I'm about to put a finger on it. <laughs> As a contrast, you have all the agents who are dressed in their suits and ties. So they're obviously the uptight enemy. What do you think of this presentation of sexuality as a recruiting tool, which is a little bit what it felt like to me? Boy, it worked. Sign me up is all I have to say. Yeah, exactly. There's clearly a seductive element. Think of it this way. Morpheus is tracking Neo extensively, right? He could probably likely bring him over any time in a variety of different ways if you wanted to. But what happens instead? Follow the white rabbit on this cute girl's shoulder and go to this club where Trinity comes to whisper in your ear. They are making an appeal to more than just his dawning sense that there is something else out there. There is an appeal strictly to his libido with these things. So it's got to be, there's a little taste of it at least, that kink is a way that they can identify those that might be amenable to thinking outside of the more comfortable sexual options available in the Matrix. Because Zion, it's apparently nonstop latex rubbing. Sidebar, can you imagine the amount of Matrix slash fiction that's out there? Full disclosure, I haven't gone down that road. You were expecting me to say, boy, I know all about it, but no, I've stayed away. I, was I made it all up in my head. To say you wrote some. <laughs> <laughs> Neo, notably, he never exactly goes that route. His costume is generally more monastic, while everyone else's costume might as well be covered in lube. And what does it say that this is what happens when they are ready to go to work, quote unquote? This is how they manifest. When you're unplugged and on the ship, your clothing is nondescript and worn. I can assume they choose how they appear since they have this ability to override the matrix. So this is a choice they are making to look like this, which just further leads me to think, how does procreation work in the matrix? Oh my gosh. Thank you. Is Thomas Anderson, was he born of a woman? How did they make the people actually have babies outside the matrix in those right. pods? I, I don't Because I don't wouldn't know. it be beneficial to the machine to encourage sex? or at least procreation, like I said. They need more human batteries, it seems, all the time. So maybe they just harvest what they need from the batteries to make more batteries? I don't know. I've got big question marks all over the place <laughs> without answers. But if you're using Neo and Trinity as the recruiting tools, I'm okay with that. Speaking, though, of how you present in the Matrix, there's something I feel like let's talk about right now. I was thinking about talking about it later, but let's get into it. I just found out, I didn't know this before, that the character Switch was originally going to be played by a man and a woman. 
The idea was that in the real world, the character would be played by a male actor, and in the Matrix, that person would manifest in female form. And that would have been a groundbreaking concept at the time. It still kind of blows my mind a little bit. It is not surprising the studio totally nixed that idea. So we ended up with just a female actress playing that role. What, was Will Hayes back in charge again? I know. But then it's fascinating to see now how androgynous Trinity appears, and when you put Neo and Trinity together, they're almost sort of the same person. That same short haircut, the same dark features, the same glasses, the same leather, the same clothes. And so it seems like all of us have a way in somehow through one or both of those characters. Unless you're just a narc and you associate with Agent Smith in that case. One of the things I like about Smith, though, is that his assessments are always on the mark. The things he says, they are inevitably true, it feels like, even those things that reveal more of himself than he might want to. This initial interrogation of Neo that he does, it's not far off the mark. Neo is special and the rules don't apply to him. And I think Neo does suspect as much, but maybe hasn't put such a specific finger on that feeling yet. Of course he wants to escape cubicle life. Who in that circumstance doesn't daydream of that? And I do like the way the film embraces the thing that you were specifically mentioning, that wrong man trope. And his pursuit in this scene and the score is helpfully familiar in those sequences. One of the things that sticks out when you return to the film after 20 years, or at least for me, is how traditional parts of the score actually are. As I remembered it in my mind, it was all very dance slash electronica oriented, but several significant sections here are a bit of a throwback to that very specific type of old fashioned strings and brass, which definitely makes me think of Hitchcock every time. Because when he's looking down from outside the ledge onto that square below, again, that North by Northwest idea, it's straight out of Bernard Herrmann. Considering the technology that was available at this point, though, it is definitely much more hyper-stylized than Hitchcock was ever able to be. It certainly gets your attention right away, but something that might be similar to those older films, an element that stood out to me in the opening sequences, are how the cops and other side characters within the Matrix, they remain pretty faceless. This de-emphasis on these characters, it did a couple of things for me as I rewatch it. One, it further drives home the point of how nondescript everyone is as you drift through this world that is designed to have all the edges sanded off. And it also really underlined for me what star-making turns these roles were for some of these performers. They really stand out against that anonymous backdrop. Keanu, he was doing okay at the time, but this was an entirely different level of success. Carrie Ann Moss was an unknown quantity to a lot of people, including me, though she had done some television. If you were Canadian, you were probably more familiar. Same for Hugo Weaving. You likely knew him if you were Australian, but mainstream American audiences were largely unfamiliar with him as well. And only because I follow that kind of thing. I knew him from Proof and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, but he's completely different from both of those parts at this point. It's also a little bit fun to look back and see how it could have gone with the actors that were either attached or were rumored to have been considered for certain roles. Keanu apparently only got it after Will Smith, Brad Pitt, Nicolas Cage, Val Kilmer, and Johnny Depp all said no. Russell Crowe turned down the role of Morpheus. If Janet Jackson didn't have so many scheduling conflicts as she did, she might have been Trinity. Jean Reno didn't want to go all the way to Australia to be Agent Smith. So it's one of those fun how the sausage gets made things that makes you realize that these things are often just complete dumb luck in terms of chemistry and the success of a film. Because when you look back, this process likely happened with all of the greatest films ever made. I want to mention Hugo Weaving here for just a second. I've been watching all of these Wired videos with dialect coach Eric Singer, and it's taught me about this concept of oral posture, which I think you completely see with weaving. It's how you carry every single muscle in your face and your body to get this specific dialect out. And he modeled it a lot on Walter Cronkite, which I think you can hear. But it's so unbelievably perfect. Every nuance, every speech pattern, every rolling of a vowel sound or hard consonant, and sanding off his own edges, it works so well. So you're saying it wouldn't have been as imposing if he had come in and said, it's the year 1999. 
<laughs> oi, oi, oi. Well, funny you mention oral posture here, because when Neo is unable to speak because his mouth disappears, this is the first indication to him that they control his reality. And this bug that they plant in his belly button, this is really a 21st century update of cops with rubber hoses and phone books. This is a very neo-noir, get it, interrogation. <laughs> You're just full of it today. Well, let's talk a little bit about Neo's meeting with Morpheus here. Thinking of the way that movies impact the culture and vice versa, it is astonishing to me, and this is kind of a side tangent before we get into that, the way the red pill thing has taken on a life of its own. And I didn't know that until you told me about it, and I wish I still didn't know. Yeah, exactly. It has been infused with a meaning that the creators couldn't have anticipated on the internet, which is a matrix all its own. It has become synonymous with a certain conservative line of thinking, very specifically anti-feminism and closely associated with the men's rights movement. So it's a sterling example of the genie being out of the bottle and the author's creation becoming the ultimate irony. And I think a lot of this boils down to sexuality too, strangely, though it's a much more crude version of that. In the red pill world on Reddit, for example, the knowledge, quote unquote, that you receive is that women are largely responsible for your every unhappiness. But there's an irony in that community as well, because so much of their energy is devoted to having sex with these women that they then also apparently despise. We don't have to go too far into that. Yeah, please. Let's not. <laughs> but to say that it's stupid and abhorrent and self-contradictory and hateful. But the interesting thing is that the pills have proliferated to the point that it's horrifying and comical all at once. There are black pills, green pills, purple pills, brown pills, iron pills, more and more. It has long left behind that duality in the matrix that is truth versus illusion, this simple basic idea. As dumb as the movement is that has produced these offshoots, it does raise a question that I think is interesting about the value of the choice you make and how much influence you exert on defining those choices. And what I mean by that is that it seems like you can choose the truth that suits you best from an ever splintering set of subsects. Religion, ever heard of it? So what I come back to is the truth that Morpheus is selling, informed by his zealotry for this idea that Neo is the one, is it true that there are only two paths? And even before that, the concept that there is the one, that someone originally set the first people free and then died and was going to be reborn. So you have to start with that first and then dedicate your life at that point and it seems like there can be no other path than, yes, there's a one, and Neo is it. There were other versions of the film in which he had previously looked for five other possible the ones. So at this point, Morpheus definitely seems like a disciple and a proselytizer. So is there really a choice being offered? I like the meta text of this as well, because the Wachowskis' personal lives would also seem to indicate that a binary choice is an artificially limited one. I wonder if they've ever rethought this particular fork in the road of only having the choice of one pill or the other. There's a game you could play, substitute the matrix with the term gender binary, and see how the film plays out. Now, when the film was first released, so this is way back in, both Wachowskis said that they would have taken the blue pill if they were provided that quote-unquote choice. Other things that I think are interesting that I take from this meeting, you mentioned a little bit of it, the precision and the ponderous emphasis on certain speech patterns. It makes Fishburne and Weaving mirrors of each other in a way. And then that feeling that brought Neo to Morpheus in the first place, being different. The implication being that it is smarter the way that this is described is tantalizing to every weirdo outcast, which is why I think a lot of people gravitate to this movie, outsiders especially. It's a justification and a validation for everything that they've ever felt. We, I guess I could say instead of they, I'm probably part of that group as well. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think it's also a little bit how cult leaders work. You're telling them that only I understand you and that what you're believing and feeling is the only truth. And that I've invested in you a sense that you are 
the savior, holy geez. Yeah. It's convenient that that thing is never really concretely defined. That way the recipient can apply this to whatever their circumstance or their inner monologue dictates. Because we've got Kantian philosophy, Platonic philosophy, Buddhism, Christianity, anything in between, agnosticism. I mean, it just goes everywhere. I don't even think it goes as deeply as that. I don't think any of that is that deeply held a philosophy. I think it's just appealing to those kids who are the only person who listens to Skinny Puppy in their little town, who obviously think they're onto something different, more interesting, and better than all of these people that make fun of them for that. In addition to those things, I really like the Alice in Wonderland correlations. To get away from the imaginary internet pills for a second, the actual question of drug culture within the Matrix is interesting to me. This white rabbit is obviously a decidedly psychedelic reference. Neo's friends, when they come to meet him at his door, they mention mescaline. Drugs function in the film, I think, in the way that sexuality does, similar to that. The openness to experience is how they first identify you as a possible recruit. How intertwined do you feel like the drugs and the sex are in this presentation? Are they two separate ideas or are they too closely related to each other that you can't separate them? Personally speaking, they're two separate ideas, but they do run parallel tracks. I think especially for me at a certain age, I took mushrooms twice, maybe three times. Was it around this time? It was. It was. I was that age and all it made me do, it didn't make me see the truth. I just sang the cranberries really loud and took my clothes off, but I probably would have done that anyway. I think I feel the same as you. Speaking strictly from personal experience, they are not inextricable. I've never taken an illicit drug, and yet I have had a variety of sexual experiences that the average person might not have had. So I think you don't have to have one to have the other, and you don't have to do one to the exclusion of the other either. Is that going to be in your secondary podcast? Put a finger on it. <laughs> <laughs> Which pill do you take? Uh, once again, a dead deli. Probably the blue pill, though it can change. So even with the mushroom experience, this offer of a drug to see the truth, again, a very psychedelic conceit, you don't go that route? I feel like I'm seeing the truth every single day right now, and it is not fun most of the time. So depending on the day, it would be take the blue pill if the dream world is better, or take the red pill if it means that I could blow everything up. So speaking of this time in your life, I'm guessing this is early college. Is that about right? Yeah. Well, it all sort of blends together. Early and middle and late college were all kind of the same because I was in for a short period of time. Okay. So late college through being completely on my own, figuring those things out. Got it. Well, the reason I ask is because I sometimes balk at the freshman philosophy aspect of the film. This whole thing of, why do my eyes hurt? Because you've never used them before. <laughs> How do you define real? The thing with his name. There are just a few elements that it's easy to poke fun at, for instance. But it really resonated with intellectuals at the time. One of my favorite contemporary thinkers, Cornell West, he was even in the sequels. So is the engagement with these thinkers merited? Or is it that we just have so few films that take on philosophy so overtly that it stuck out like a sore thumb in 1999? Or did I just miss those layers in Austin Powers? <laughs> I think you're right on the money. And I think also the idea of keeping it not too specific so we can sort of float over everything and we're presenting questions more than answers. I will have to say, though, it only now occurred to me the meaning, multiple meanings of the name Cypher. It didn't really get to me at the time. So evidently, I wasn't even smart enough to really get a full handle on everything that was happening. Is that my youth? Is that me also being a little bit of a tourist and dipping in and out? Because the reading lists that the actors were given are things that I haven't touched upon. I do think ultimately the Wachowskis were trying to go big and they were trying to go deep. They are thinkers, but more than anything, they're storytellers. Well, they definitely played up that angle at the time. Warner Brothers had a website up for a while that emphasized that specific aspect of it. And now you can probably find quite a few books that deal specifically with that part of it. This is a treatment that not very many pop culture properties receive. 
so I can't be wholly dismissive of it or annoyed by it, because here's the thing. Everyone has to start somewhere. Everyone has to ask those first questions. And if you or I or anyone else are fortunate enough to be farther down the road in our personal investigations, maybe we're not as far as we think if our response to this is to scoff at neophytes. I do admit it is something that I struggle with. I still find it too easy to be frustrated by others not moving at the same speed that I am or that haven't arrived at the same place, maybe. But that's something that I have to keep working on. That's a fault in me, not in the person that is just beginning to come to grips with these questions. There's a reason that Plato's allegory of the cave is still discussed centuries later. The difficulties of leaving the captivity of ignorance behind are eternal. Descartes and questions of intellectual autonomy are obviously another influence here. This central idea of how perception defines reality, or even if there is such a thing, these are all heady concepts for a science fiction movie to take on, essentially an action film. And some embrace it like Cornell West, but then you have people, let's call them philosophers, on the other side that seemed downright angry about the idea that this could be considered in that way. But in your case, does the film do enough to offset something like Martin Scorsese's assessment of the Marvel films as being akin to an amusement park? Is it weightier for you than that? I don't know that it's weightier, but it's more interesting, at least to me, that I can come back and still try to grapple with, okay, the film one said this, what about number two, what about number three, to apply my own level of intellectual rigor wherever I am in that process, and keep coming up with questions that could challenge the veracity or the content or the efficacy of the film. And you know me, I'm always still okay with not having an answer. I think we feel similarly about it, if not exactly the same, because there is definitely a sensory overload as you are led through all these incredible dynamic set pieces. And I think I'm not the same sort of person like Jean Baudrillard, who got really angry that a concept he wrote about was, to his mind, distorted in the film. I'm the sort of person who then wants to go read that book and see for myself. It's a ridiculous thing that some philosophers engage in that somehow ideas have ownership. That's absurd. If you as a contemporary philosopher aren't building on those that came centuries before you, a long string of them, if you can't be honest about that, that's just ridiculous. But to go back to where I was, it definitely transcends that amusement park label for me. One thing I wanted to ask you about in relation to that, I think it definitely has to do with the hyperactive movement of it. Do you find a sense of speed critical to appreciating the film? If it were paced significantly slower, for instance, would that be to the detriment of the questions that it's asking? In terms of possibly giving you more time to ruminate on them and maybe find holes mm -hmm. in them or look for examples later on that refute whatever was proposed. Right. Or is it an inextricable part of the thrill tangling with these philosophical issues while moving at full speed? This insistence that you think and act near simultaneously. Well, it certainly puts me in the mind of Neo that I'm in his same position, just going with it, trying to figure it out. And then as the viewer, it makes me just want to watch it over and over again. I think it's that speed is what is new about it is what really hooks me as a viewer too. Because it really did announce itself as something like we had never seen before. And that speed is the critical element of that. Because we've seen kung fu movies. We've seen westerns. But none of them have ever moved like this. None of them have ever been this fast before. And then the real world implication of that is something I like here as subtext better than text. We can now, through Neo, like you were saying you felt, see things that we've never seen before. There is one thing we've seen here before, though. Joey Pants, one of my all-time favorites. Is there any doubt that Joey Pants is going to be the asshole, the fly in the ointment of this? Carrie Ann Moss dealt with him previously in Memento. She should have known not to trust this guy. And did you notice he uses Jesus a lot when he's talking to Neo? Do you think that's a coincidence? No. I don't. I think it was all carefully written. That first scene where they're interacting, I really like it. You mentioned this earlier. The distortion of Neo's scream when he's sent to wake up in his pod for the first time. 
it's a really nice bit of sound design as it goes from organic to digital. And then he ends up in this capsule and it's all jelly and no eyebrows. It's just a tool video at this point. <laughs> How much do you think this is speaking to the transformation that the Wachowskis were soon to undergo? Were they trying to tell us about that in some way? Well, like you mentioned, they did both confirm their gender identity after the Matrix. And I love that Lily encourages that critical reassessment through the lens of their transness. Because as she said, it's an excellent reminder that art is never static. And I read an incredibly interesting essay from another trans writer who said the film definitely replicates the trans experience prior to coming out. And that that writer was completely obsessed with the Matrix without understanding at the time why. So I'm not sure that it's something that they could have put into words at the time, but it, there definitely seems to be all of these pointers to it. Yeah, I don't want to speculate too much, obviously, because it's not my story. But in retrospect, it seems quite obvious. But that's easy to say with the benefit of hindsight. Although I do like what you were saying, how they encourage viewers to go back and view it specifically with that in mind. It seems like when you look at the movie as a whole, it's about transcending the limitations of the physical form and exploring what your mind is capable of, that something else can never tell you who you are. Now, if we want to tackle something that I can speak on, something that is a big part of me, let's talk a little bit about the big kung fu cinema background here. I am fond of this structure of the initiate and the mentor. With those films, those kung fu films, you frequently encounter these chosen one narratives, a kind of subset of the hero's journey. And then the way it's deployed in the film is fantastic. You get the requisite training sequences, which I always enjoy. And it was really nice to see on that monitor the reference to drunken boxing. It was something that was a little off the beaten path at the time compared to, say, jujitsu or taekwondo. I felt like it was a nice nod to people who would have been in the know in regards to martial arts films. And I really do think it's a smart and effective move that they dole out the wire foo in small doses at first. Neo isn't bound by the rules that limit their enemies, but he's only discovering that. And as his skills advance, so does the sophistication of the wire work. Do you remember the first time you saw your first wire foo, something that defied gravity and physics in a way that changed everything you thought about on-screen combat? Really, I think this was my first experience, and I could practically hear, are you ready for this, playing in the background <laughs> for me. <laughs> you know, I didn't really know anything about wire foo or that concept in relation to the kung fu films that I'd seen before. Because watching them on a Saturday afternoon, it just didn't quite register for me. I assumed that they were all acrobats. And Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon came after this film for me. And Charlie's Angels, which was also a big deal for me. Now, you may wrinkle your nose at that. Not necessarily you, the larger <laughs> you say, or you. <laughs> but it gave me that same sense of elation and free flying. And I watched all of those background features to learn about this stuff. But you've got way more experience with this stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first big oh, awesome yeah. wire foo? Absolutely. The first one that ever really knocked me out. Actually, it's more subtle, but it still knocked me out. Come Drink With Me was probably the first thing that I ever saw that gave me an inkling as to what was possible with these techniques. And then from there, it was just off to the races. And one of the things that kept coming up as I started to do more research into the scenes that I really loved, the movies that became huge favorites just for that reason... One name comes up again and again, and that's Yuan Wu Ping, who is the fight choreographer on this film. He was at Peking Opera School with Jackie Chan and Sammo Hung. And he's still working, by the way. He just was the action director on Ip Man 4. Yeah, legendary. There's no other way to say it. I can't stress that enough. And the success of this, I think, felt like a bit of a justification for audiences that had been watching his movies for decades by that point. Finally... Mainstream American audiences are getting the opportunity to see how amazing he is. And unfortunately, some of the people in those American audiences, they would have derided the films that he made his bones on, I think. But I prefer to look at it now, though, as Kung Fu is for everyone. Come on in. Watch Dreadnought. Watch Magnificent Butcher. Watch Snake in the Eagle's Shadow. They're all great. And while we're talking about Hong Kong, there's also an obvious John Woo influence here, too, I think. Sorry, let me throw in Drunken Master, too. Yeah. 
That too. But with the John Woo thing, we really get that with this two guns blazing slow motion we see in a later sequence when they're on a mission to rescue Morpheus. Sometimes philosophy and centuries old combat techniques won't do it and you have to rain shells on somebody. Man, they fetishize these shells. Don't you feel like they're just dropping all over the place? I think at some point a bird does fly uh, yeah, away. I think so. How many trench coat mafia types do you think jerked off to this shootout in the lobby? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, another negative, unforeseen offshoot. Yeah. Keep the jerking off. Just don't do <laughs> any of the rest of the terrible stuff. But to move away from that for a little bit and to talk about something maybe a little more nurturing, let's talk about Trinity for a second. To me, her name implies that she may be the most important figure in the film. She's the godhead with that. Hacker slash mother slash lover. Is it in that order? Do you read it some other way? With this viewing, I thought of it in a little bit of a different way because I tend to think of Trinity as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit being male gender. I think that's also an interesting thing to then put it into a female character. And Neo said earlier, most guys thought Trinity was a man, but is a woman here. I think of her more than anything as being his other half. They complete each other. So instead of Neo, it's duo? <laughs> yeah, and then the third being Trinity. She's the person that Neo has been waiting for to believe in himself because Morpheus is the proselytizer, which is different. And Neo is the person who makes Trinity whole in a completely different way. I shouldn't say maybe complete, they liberate each other. Yeah, but that really only happens in the sequels. <laughs> that's true. If you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, to keep talking about some name stuff sure. that's interesting. We mentioned Cypher before. There are the implications of being a mystery, but also in its ancient form, Cypher is a zero. And there's Morpheus's ship, the Nebuchadnezzar. Named after the king, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he has a dream he can't remember, but keeps searching for an answer. And then Morpheus is also the name of the god of sleep and dreams. Trinity also first appears in room 303, by the way. Neo lives in apartment 101. We talked about Switch, all sorts of interesting, fun things. And this leads me to my very important question. What would your hacker name be? That's tough. I would have it be something that would be kind of a throwback. I think my hacker name would be, in tribute to W.C. Fields, Egbert Souse. <laughs> but it would be spelled in leet speak. So it would be 3683RT50U53. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> what about you? Mine is going to be squirrel because of the way I eat and say food <laughs> in places no one knows. But it would be spelled little s... Big Q, big U, little r, asterisk, L. Take that. Did you just give away your password for all your important accounts? No, thankfully. <laughs> so you hack your way into the Matrix, but you discover the Matrix is full of really satisfying distractions. You said you would take the blue pill. This slop that they eat on board, it doesn't have everything a body needs, as they say. So what does chicken really taste like? Do you ever just look at your hand, man? The world is now burnt out <laughs> shithole. These distractions are far preferable to just being a battery, or is that just what they want you to think? You look at these bodies in stasis, and that is the most grim of outcomes, to be reduced to a pod whose worth is only measured by how efficiently they can harvest your output to power the machine. This has analogs that predate cinema, obviously, in terms of science fiction ideas, but it is something that science fiction film has been concerned with portraying since the beginning. Just look at something like Metropolis. And another reason that I bring up Metropolis is that that film and this film each have this central feminine figure, in this case, the Oracle. I think you share this with me. The Oracle is a character, and Gloria Foster specifically, this is one of my favorite parts, one of my favorite roles. It it's my just a glorious part. Favorite, yeah. Neo is brought to the Oracle along with a lot of other potentials. And it feels like that kind of Uri Geller sort of 1970s world that I definitely remember. And she is the Oracle, but she's only going to give you the information that you need. And we have that important point again. The Matrix cannot tell you who you are, even though she is in the Matrix. So I've got a series of question marks written here. 
but she tells them that he's not the one, but that Morpheus is going to sacrifice himself because he so believes in Neo. So Neo has got a choice to make. I want to back up a little bit, just a second. They're on their way to see the Oracle, yes, but apparently they stop and see their stylist first, because this is the scene that I was referring to earlier, where they are manifesting themselves in all of their sexiest outfits. Uh, they look fly as fuck here. They bust out the Sunday best for this. Switch, significantly, the only one in white. And I like the significance of highlighting this costume decision here. The most androgynous character, obviously. They're shining a light on it. Whether they're conscious of it or not, I think that Switch has to be a surrogate for the Wachowskis in this film. For one important reason that maybe they didn't even realize at the time. Switch has to die. And to me, the way I read this, the death of the old self is what makes transformation possible. Again, I don't want to speculate too much, but in retrospect, it seems like these conclusions are undeniable. I have wrestled with all of this a little bit because if the real world is this post-apocalyptic world that's burnt out, the Matrix is the place where people are finally their true selves because that is where he comes alive. And it seems like, again, if the Matrix is the internet then it's the place where people try out their personas. It seems like Neo is only Neo really in the Matrix, but that's because he's been made aware that the Matrix isn't real. Uh, I don't <laughs> I sort of <laughs> go all over the place with this. It does suggest ultimately to me that they are both inextricable and that transformation does require both the faux and the real. You are absolutely right. What you said earlier about this being a favorite scene. I love this so much. Neo's visit with her specifically with the Oracle. I like oracles as an ancient, specifically unreliable tradition of information delivery. But this Oracle makes the philosophizing fun, I think, and more approachable. I like the way that the character is written. She says, you have a good soul. And that is the genius of casting Keanu Reeves, I want to say. And it's also, this scene, my favorite part of the whole film to wrestle with. These questions that you posed. Does the Oracle exist only within the Matrix? Is she only accessible as part of the Matrix? If so, how come? The most interesting philosophical questions are handled best by her and stem from her existence and where that resides. So how can she be inside, be only in and of the Matrix the implication being that she is part of it, created and maintained by it, and yet still deliver the revolution that will occur externally and destroy said matrix. Is it a fact that the machine isn't self-aware enough, not perfect enough that it knows what she's doing within itself? Does it desire its own destruction? Are a lot of these the things that you have on your list too? Same thing. Did the Matrix and the machines read Homer? I, I don't know. Is it all just developed as another way to maybe insidiously give us some information, but not enough? Do they not know where she is? Have they not been able to infiltrate at this point? Are we in version 3.0? Who knows? This self-destructiveness of the machine, I think it's something that we also see in Agent Smith's behavior as the film nears its climax. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. I've got another one of these Wired videos to recommend. An expert on robotics is talking about how you see that in film. And he was poking fun a little bit at this concept that I mentioned earlier, which is that these films seem to immediately go to the place of machines become aware and they immediately want to murder all humans. <laughs> As opposed to, he was saying, more likely some sort of malfunction takes place that was caused by humans and then it gets righted somehow. So it's probably not going to go down that path, but it's interesting for film. So suck it, Skynet. <laughs> Take that. I did want to mention in this sequence, I think deja vu as a glitch in the Matrix is a genius little idea. I really like how fun that is to play with. Now, when this whole thing goes south and they capture Morpheus, I never believed when I was sitting in the theater that those agents were going to kill Morpheus. It was never a realistic possibility to me within the film's framework. This overhanging shadow of religion and being unable to face the fact that your messiah is not actually the one, it seemed like a greater potential punishment for him. 
It's much more fascinating to watch Agent Smith unraveling, and it reminded me so much of Lucretia Martel's film Sama when he's talking about, I must get out of here. Funny, because it made me think of George Carlin, of all things. Oh, okay. There's a George Carlin bit about human arrogance and the earth needing plastic. It couldn't make plastic itself, so it made us. We made plastic for it, and now we're expendable, but we don't realize it. Smith has this human-like arrogance, thinking that he alone can break Morpheus down. He sends the other agents away. He has been infected by humans, obviously, because he is putting forth the same sort of emotion and regret and this confession of wanting out, hating it here. He's doomed to fail, and he doesn't know it yet. Well, the big helicopter rescue is, in a word, rad. I love this. I love this dang movie. I just want to say it right now. It's so exciting. It's so wonderful to look at. And here we have the biggest and best example, I think, of that scene that took our breath away. The bullet time effect. This blew minds at the time. I know that the wire foo and stuff was incorporated into the film and that technique was decades old at that point. But bullet time, I think, has to be the Wachowski's greatest contribution to the technical side of action filmmaking. And it started in their imagination. They thought about an action sequence that slowed down time while the camera moved rapidly around all the subjects. And so they proposed the effect and then it was down to other people to come up with it. John Gaeta was the visual effects supervisor. He talks about Akira and also about Michelle Gondry as being big influences and inspirations. Just a bit about what bullet time specifically is, it allows for action in a shot to occur in slow motion while the camera moves at normal speed. And it can circle around the entire action and so that it appears that the action itself is at a normal or a variable speed. With that camera rotation also giving us the feeling of three dimensions happening right in front of our face, it just knocked me out of my seat in 1999. Well, we're not through yet we've got the big subway battle because neo has come into his own he is the one and there's the big reveal of what trinity was told by the matrix and she brings him back to life essentially or brings him to his destiny one of those things and during this sequence he flies through agent smith and he yells i'm back baby (laughs) <laughs> I had to get that joke that in. Gil Pison? <laughs> yes, exactly. The only thing that I wish that the subway fight had is that kung fu trope of calling out the technique that you're using as you're doing it. Hell yeah. Tiger claw? It would probably have to be a digitized version of it, though. Your tiger claw is strong, but taste my 96k modem. Yeah. Speaking of technology, as we're heading towards the end here, do you know who the actor is that Neo takes the cell phone from? Because... He has a line, which seems weird. None of these other characters have a line. But this actor actually has a speaking part in the film. Out of the sea of anonymous faces. Do you know who that is? I was not able to figure it out. No. Somebody's brother, maybe? Maybe somebody that worked on the film? Could be. Because there are interesting cameos. Because the Wachowskis are the window cleaners in that scene where Neo makes his escape from the office. Oh, sheesh. Didn't even notice. I also didn't notice the first time around when he's in the construct... It's all twins, and those are actual twins walking around. Well, ultimately, like the agents, the film has to follow some rules. And because of that, I never fear for the team as a whole. Individually, maybe. For instance, we lose Switch. Are you a little surprised that Neo is ultimately saved by love, quote-unquote? Or does that fit all right for you in terms of humanity is what we're saving here? Honestly, that was kind of my favorite part. Really? Yeah, it. I like that there was also a deeply romantic element to it. Maybe that makes me a dope. I don't know. But when I think about the two of them as being halves and being a true partnership and liberating each other, it seems to just make so much sense. I do admit, I realized about halfway through this, I didn't remember that that was the ultimate aim. It's been... 20 years since I saw it the first time, and maybe one viewing in the intervening years. I didn't remember that it was specifically let my people go. It could have been smaller scale in terms of ambitions, and it wouldn't have surprised me. And I think that epic scale, it may be one of the reasons, one of the only things about it that fails for me. 
its failure for me is rooted in the idea that it doesn't achieve a totality. Its text doesn't account for a whole enough picture for me to say that this is one of the greatest films of all time. Even with all of the work that they put into it and all of the thought to make it come alive. Right. Specifically for me, this is based in the fact that it introduces ideas without offering sufficient answers to the questions that it raises. If you are creating a philosophical text, which is what I think the Wachowskis were attempting, it is incumbent upon you to at least try to do that, to provide answers to the questions you ask. And no, the sequels don't count for me. There's a purity that feels like it was lost between The Matrix and then the first sequel. And if your idea requires the extension of a part two and a part three, then maybe you should have gone back to the drawing board before completing part one. Because I don't think there was any way that they could have known that this movie, which was odd for the time, was going to be such a huge success. There was no way that they could have accounted for that. There was no way that I think they were thinking, let's hold some mythology and further explanation in reserve for sequel purposes. I just don't think that was happening. So what they put out to me is a little incomplete. In fact, I think one of the interesting and most ironic things about the failure of the sequels is that apparently no one wanted the original explained in greater detail. I say it all the time. People only want so smart and no smarter. Because Lawrence Fishburne said he never thought the movie was, would succeed because it was smart. Do you think they could have achieved this totality of world building that you would have liked them to have achieved in two and a half hours? Is it possible? I definitely think it's possible because the fault I'm finding is not that the world itself is missing detail. It's that they didn't offer answers to the questions they ask. If they had specifically done more to address that, I definitely think it could have succeeded in two and a half hours. But then again, what do I know? We'll just go on residing in the comfortable illusion that is this podcast. <laughs> Once you go watch that Craig Bierko movie you mentioned. <laughs> do the returns diminish geometrically for you as we go through the sequel? They do. I have almost no memory of the sequels, and I waited for them to come out and was there on day one. But it wasn't until reading about Matrix number four that I realized, oh, Trinity and Neo died at the end of the third one. Oops. Spoiler alert. Ugh. I'd totally forgotten. Only a couple of moments stick out for me. But yeah, finally seeing Sex in the Matrix, it didn't really hit the point for me that The Matrix did. It didn't feel as fresh and as exciting. You mentioned part four is in production. Do you have high hopes for it? Because it's always the fourth installment of a franchise that's the best, right? <laughs> we all know your love of Jaws the Revenge with Michael Caine. But there have been some legitimate fourth installments, right? For example, where do you rank Goblet of Fire in the Harry Potter catalog? Uh, that one's totally fine, but it's not my favorite. But it's not a letdown. Thunderball as the fourth Bond. I don't remember that one at all. Okay. I like Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. That yeah, one I enjoyed it had quite the cool bit. whales in it. And then, of course, Friday the 13th, Part Four, the final chapter. It's that bonkers installment with Crispin Glover and Corey Feldman. Oh, Lord. Did I watch that one with yeah, you? Yeah, you did. Okay. It's super fun. It's not great cinema, but that's okay. So it's not completely unheard of for a fourth installment to not be a uniformly awful cash grab. I will say though, that the odds do break the other way most of the time. I think you're probably right. Well, that does actually lead me to another example that shows, at least to me, it explains why I said this changed my life. And that is The Phantom Menace, which is technically the fourth Star Wars film. It came out in the same year. I had totally forgotten about that. I do remember how excited I was for The Phantom Menace, all of this anticipation built up. Really? I don't think of you as a Star Wars person. Absolutely. I was there on the first day. I took people from work. They knew how excited I was. One of them even got me a commemorative cup. And then they never spoke to you again. Exactly. <laughs> it was a gigantic letdown. And I think maybe if you put those two films together, it shows why The Matrix seems to shine so much more brightly, and seem sparer, but somehow more open. So I'm guessing your recommendation is not The Phantom Menace, is that right? What do you have for us instead? I picked Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon that I mentioned before from 2000, right after this film, directed by Ang Lee, with Chow Yun-Fat, Michelle Yeoh, and Zhang Ziyi. Yin Wu-Ping was the action director for this film as well, so I wanted to talk about him a little bit more. 
Crouching Tiger is about a young Chinese warrior who steals a sword from a famed swordsman and then escapes into a world of romantic adventure with a mysterious man in the frontier. I was crazy about this film when I first saw it, probably because that world had been opened up to me in a very special way, a world that I was mostly ignorant of. It was a huge entry point for me into the world of Wuja, plus Michelle Yeoh, amazing Chow Yun Fat, plus romance, plus it's very female warrior focused. I could go on and on. If you haven't seen it yet, watch it. Watch everything that inspired it and everything that came after it. Just never stop. What's your recommendation? I wanted to go with the straightest line from here to there that is still somewhat neglected by the majority of mainstream fans of The Matrix. And that's a title that I mentioned briefly earlier, Ghost in the Shell from 1995. It's an anime film directed by Mamoru Oshii, based on a manga of the same name, by Masamune Shiro, and it's about a cyborg federal agent on the trail of a futuristic criminal who illegally hacks into the computerized minds of cyborg human hybrids. It too deals with the perception of what is real, focusing most specifically on questions about identity and what that means. It is visually stunning, and it has that same hyper-stylized, hyper-kinetic feeling that The Matrix has. There are actually a handful of sequences in The Matrix that you could say are almost frame-by-frame frame homage to Ghost in the Shell. But Ghost in the Shell is the pure stuff. You take away the other mishmash of influences on The Matrix, take away the Kung Fu, take away the Westerns. If you want the unadulterated, beating, cyberpunk heart of The Matrix, start right here. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Ghost in the Shell. And that brings us to the end of episode 126. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes. So you never have to go a week without new magic lantern in your life. If you would like to just get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Laura Cannon over at the Fatal Films Podcast, the fine gentleman at Fuds on Film, Jeff Duncanson, Andy Wolverton, Matteo Boscarol, Summer Ann Burton, Dean Estes, and Ross McLeod. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so that we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 